All right, so we're going to get started. Introduce yourself, Steve. Uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Steve Sider. I will not uh, give the full uh, descriptor, Kathleen. Good try. Uh, but it's my pleasure to welcome you here. Caitlin uh, and I are representing Cleary, the Center for Leading Research and Education. And as um, as we know, the center has been doing these lunch and learns, and we've uh, Kathleen and I were doing these before I think the center kind of took them on. Uh, it's just as a way to interact around various topics. Um, and uh, a number of months ago, uh, Hina and, and Caitlin and I touched base about the possibility of her doing a, a presentation today. And so we're really thankful, Hina, that you're able to do that. So here's here's my best attempt, okay, Hina, at the introduction. And then you can correct me if I get any of this wrong, which I'm I'm notorious for doing. So first of all, uh, I'll say not only welcome to the Lunch and Learn, Hina, but welcome to Laurier. I know you've been here for now two years, came in 2020. Uh, Hina is the, the manager of the uh, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Office, the EDI Training, Planning and Strategic Initiatives. Got it. Thank you. Um, Hina has a PhD in history from Queen's University in uh, South Asian uh, diaspora um, history, and uh, which is awesome and fantastic, and uh, and comes to, to Laurier uh, in this role. Uh, and I think par primarily what we're going to hear, if you read the description or saw the title for today, is a reflection of the of the work that Hina does. Um, so really quick introductions. Caitlin, you and I don't need to do any further introductions. Kathleen, do you want to just let, uh, and, and Jennifer, I see that you've joined us as well. Do you want to just do a quick intro and then Hina will pass it over to you. Sure. Uh, hi, Hina. My name is Kathleen. I'm a full-time faculty member in the Faculty of Education. Um, I mainly teach in the Master of Education student affairs field, and my research looks at understanding the experiences of specific populations of students um, on college and university campuses, and then how to tailor student services to support them. And for what it's worth, I was very excited to attend today. Um, I'm developing a course, Interpreting Research in Education. And so I've been thinking about how to kind of infuse some EDI into that course development. Um, and I'm not very experienced in that area. So I was very excited to be here. That's awesome. Jennifer, I know your, your video is off, but are you able to give a quick intro? I am. Um, I just had to see if I could grab a student so I can't turn my camera on just yet. Um, so I'm Jennifer Holm. I'm in the Faculty of Education and I'm the Mathematics Education Specialist here. Uh, so I was just really interested in the topic and um, thinking about you know ways to incorporate into my own research, because a lot of my research is around equity. So I thought it would be interesting to hear some different expects, um, uh, perspectives on that. Excellent. So on that note, uh, Hina, we'll turn it over to you and, and uh, look forward to, uh, I, we are recording this just as a note, and we're going to pause the recording if at any point uh, that um, makes sense to do and if people are comfortable, more comfortable that way, we'll, but we'll proceed with recording the bulk of what Hina is going to present today. Over to you. Awesome, thank you, um, Steve, for that introduction and for everyone for introducing yourselves. I'm actually really excited to be talking to this group today. So um, let me just give me a moment so I can screen share. Make sure you can see my own notes. Okay, um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this presentation, which is gonna be all about strategies for embedding equity, diversity, and inclusion into your research process. Um, my name is Hina Misri, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the manager of EDI training, planning, and strategic initiatives in the office of the AVP EDI. Um, before we move any further, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. So, um, Wilfrid Laurier University and its campuses are located on the Haldeman Tract, which is the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, and it symbolizes the agreement to share the land to the mutual benefit of all of its inhabitants. The Haldeman Treaty of October 25, 1784 was signed by the British with their allies, the Six Nations, after the American Revolution. And despite being the largest reserve demographically in Canada, those nations now reside on less than 5% of this original territory, which was about 950,000 acres. Um, so I really want the land acknowledgement to serve as a reminder of this sort of long-standing history that shapes the world that we currently live in. 
Um, but ob obviously this process of reconciliation and decolonization don't stop at land acknowledgements. Rather, these statements are sort of there to push us to reflect on how we can address and dismantle settler colonialism in our everyday life, um, especially in the institutions that we operate in and in the research process in particular. Um, so at Laurier, this could mean doing things like reflecting and acting on the ways in which locally and globally, the university itself is shaped by settler colonialism. Um, Canadian universities have historically taken part in the expropriation of Indigenous land and resources. Um, this has taken shape through things like partnerships, uh, research partnerships with extractive industries, um, violence and exclusion perpetuated by the academy towards Indigenous students, scholars, and community members. So all these things really do inform the way that we should inform the way that we go about, uh, you know, our work sort of going forward. So um, just an overview of today's session and how today's discussion is going to proceed. Um, I'm going to begin today's uh, discussion with a, an overview of how systemic inequities um, take shape in academia with a focus on research. I'll then um, discuss some of the roadblocks that researchers encounter when they're trying to embed EDI into their research process. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, citational politics as one of those sort of forms of systemic inequity and roadblocks. And then I'll end this, uh, this session with an overview of some questions that researchers can, um, some, uh, some questions that researchers can ask um, of their own projects, uh, which can help them embed EDI throughout the entire research process. So um, it's a little bit more of a like maybe technical, um, concrete, practical things that are going to be in this presentation, but I hope that you'll find those things helpful. So let's jump in. So in this section, I'm going to be giving an overview of some of the different ways in which historical exclusion um, shapes academia. Um, before we move forward, though, I just want to review three key concepts. So those are privilege, positionality, and bias. Um, privilege refers to distinct and unearned advantages or benefits resulting from certain aspects of one's identity. So elements of one's identity and lived experiences can confer advantages or disadvantages in life that an individual had no control over and didn't try to consciously obtain for themselves. So an example of privilege related to being able-bodied would be not needing to think about whether the building or your class or your meetings are held have ramps or elevators. If you're, if you're not a wheelchair user, you don't necessarily have to think about that. You wouldn't need to plan ahead, look up where, whether the building was accessible or worry about not being able to reschedule um, or attend at all if the building wasn't accessible. So that's, again, just a privilege that being able-bodied grants you in the situation and you didn't do anything in particular to earn that advantage on your own. It's, um, it's just there, right? So the second term I have on the slide is positionality. Positionality is a framework for understanding how privilege is fluid and relational, and it recognizes that one's identity can confer advantages and disadvantages depending on the context at hand. So the way that our identities operate or may confer or um, I guess like detract like privileges in a particular situation like is different depending on the context that you're in. And then the third term that I have on the slide is bias. So bias refers to implicit and explicit prejudices, inclinations, or preferences. Everybody has biases and they're informed by our lived experiences, our positionality, and our privileges. Biases um, shape our judgment and the way that we perceive the world and the way that the world perceives us. And so I raise these points to just push back against the idea that as researchers, we can claim impartiality and, and or neutrality. Um, instead, I want to actually encourage researchers to consider the ways in which their own identities and perspectives might actually impact how they go about the research process um, and to just be a little bit more upfront and aware of that. So I now want to talk a little bit about how these things actually take shape within research contexts. So on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see the cover image of the equity myth. Um, this is a really awesome study. It provides an awesome overview of systemic inequities in the Canadian research landscape in particular, um, with a focus on race, gender, and indigeneity. And if you want more detail on the points that I'm going to be just sort of overviewing quickly on this slide, chapter 11 of this book outlines the research on these issues, like with peer-reviewed sources, cited, etc. So I really encourage you to take the time to actually read, to, to check out this book. It's available as an ebook through Laurier Library as well. Um, and, and take some time to read it. It's really insightful. So on the left-hand side of the slide, I've listed the different places that bias, um, privilege, and positionality can shape higher education, training, and research. I'm uh, sorry, teaching and research. Um, so systemic inequities shape barriers and pathways to graduate education and through research careers. Uh, particularly, they shape who is advantaged and disadvantaged by the informal networks of support that oftentimes shape graduate studies and progression through careers. Um, 
systemic, systemic inequity shape academic networks that one has access to, as well as access to social, social capital. Um, inequities can play out through things like affinity biases. Um, systemic inequities can show up in bias reference letters, teaching evaluations, and within um, classroom power dynamics themselves. They result in disparities in peer academic settings. So who is invited to speak at conferences, panels, and keynotes? Um, an example of this in my own field just recently, um, there was a webinar series on Indian Ocean World Studies that had no racialized women speakers and no scholars based in the areas bordering the Indian Ocean. Um, the only speakers that they had on their, on their list were um, in the webinar sort of roster were, were European and North American scholars. Um, so again, it's like who is actually invited to share about their research, who is actually given the opportunity to be positioned as an expert on a particular topic. Um, oftentimes these things play out in these particular um, settings where people have the opportunity to actually share, um, make connections, build connections, um, gain citations, like et cetera. So again, um, they also, um, inequities also show up as discrepancies in citational politics and um, canonical or curriculum biases. So these power dynamics shape the intellectual traditions that inform our own research work and the ways in which we introduce our students to a particular field of study. Um, and then finally, inequities also shape how service work is recognized and compensated. An example of this would be um, faculty who often take on um, informal mentorship roles to, um, to support like marginalized students and in the interest of like community advocacy. This is work that might have a huge impact on marginalized communities, um, but it's not really um, as highly recognized or visible or valued in academic adjudication processes like tenure promotion, hiring, grant applications, et cetera. So again, these are just, some of the different ways that um, the authors of the equity myth have, um, have outlined the impact of bias and systemic inequities on the Canadian research landscape. So I think it really speaks to the much wider like global research landscape as well. So in the next section, I'm gonna just speak a little bit about um, uh, roadblocks to embedding EDI in your research process. Um, I want to, like in the section after this, I'll be talking about like two sections after this, I'll be talking about strategies for how to embed EDI in your research process as a whole. But um, I think I'm starting here because I want to preface this by recognizing that the work of actually embedding EDI into your research process is not safe uh, work. It's not easy work and that there's challenges to anyone who does want to make this a priority. So um, just to outline some roadblocks to embedding EDI in your research process. So one of these things, um, the Canadian research landscape doesn't always reward researchers who mobilize their work towards addressing systemic inequities, both in the research process and sometimes in like the research topic at hand. Um, some of the reasons for this are that timelines and constraints of um, like granting agencies that they offer, like funding bodies don't always, and undergraduate and graduate programs and things like that don't, don't always allow the time needed for reciprocal relationship building with marginalized communities who might be stakeholders in that research. Um, those who serve on like grant adjudication and peer review panels aren't always familiar with inclusive research methodologies, approaches, and scholarship, and they might penalize those who take on less conventional approaches. Um, research funding priorities have not always centered the needs and perspectives of communities who have been historically excluded from or harmed by the academy um, by academic researchers. Um, the tri agency and many other research administration and governing bodies don't always hold researchers accountable for addressing systemic inequities or ensuring that research is done ethically. Um, there's a lack of expertise oftentimes in the decision making spaces of the research landscape that serve as roadblocks to, to doing this work. Um, there can also be things like power differentials within research relationships, such as those between like supervisor and student or between marginalized scholars and the institution or department or their own professional associations that makes these changes slow and difficult to move quickly. Um, basically, the point of this information is not to discourage people from embedding EDI in the research process, but just to make you aware of exactly what I mean when I say that there are systemic reasons why our research landscape is not equitable. Um, and not all the responsibility for this rests on individual researchers. Um, you do have the power to change things in your own practice, but there are also larger changes that are needed within the institution within national and international research networks that make embedding EDI into research difficult. Um, so with that, another important piece of this question is also, um, you know, rethinking research excellence and, and interrogating like what is research excellence. Um, so rethinking how EDI can inform academic adjudication processes is also an important part of embedding EDI into the research process. Um, scholarship on 
academic peer review processes, academic judgment, and understandings of meritocracy reveal that scholars don't always share common understandings of what research excellence means. Um, in, so, in, this, in this case, even um, this is the case even among scholars in the same discipline. So one example of, of um, a scholar who's maybe taken a look at some of these things is um, Michelle Lamont. So in her book, uh, How Professors Think, sociologist Michelle Lamont observed how peer review panels define research excellence using criteria such as originality, quality, diversity, and feasibility and significance, as well as the weight that they assign to these criteria in different contexts of academic review. Um, and she did this in order to understand which factors define and constrain what academics see as excellent. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, she found that distinct evaluative cultures within um, social, different social sciences and humanities disciplines existed. Um, overall, she found that within every multidisciplinary academic peer review setting that she observed in her study, of, like which is this book, um, a group of reviewers would always be developing their own shared rules of deliberation to bridge their different under their different evaluative disciplinary cultures to in order to like facilitate some sort of agreement about what constitutes research excellence. Um, and so she states that academic excellence is produced and defined in a multitude of sites and by a, an array of actors. It may look different when observed through the lenses of um, editorial peer review, books that are read by generations of students, current articles published by top journals, elections at national academies or appointments at elite institutions. So in other words, rather than any universal conception of academic excellence, we're constantly creating new shared understandings of research excellence depending on the context that we're operating in. Um, and so in, in recent years, scholars have uh, across disciplines have called for metrics of research excellence that um, avoid replicating convention. So this means avoiding rewarding traditional markers of prestige and uh, instead focusing on the merits of work itself. Um, scholars have also called for metrics of research excellence that protect excellence in locally relevant research. So rather than pursuing what we might perceive as this sort of universalistic notions of research excellence, consider how local priorities or community priorities can also be important factors in shaping research priorities. Um, scholars have also called for those taking part in academic adjudication processes to consider local and community research and knowledge mobilization priorities to decenter research agendas driven by scholars in Europe and North America or the academy itself. Um, and to draw on both qualitative and quantitative evaluations of research quality. Um, this book that I've cited at the bottom is actually really awesome and, and sort of defines some of the calls to action that I've listed on this slide as well. Um, so next, um, I wanna just tackle some of the issues that may arise when relying on traditional metrics of research excellence um, that many of us are probably very familiar with. So these include things like bibliometrics, H index indices, volume of publications, connections to prestigious institutions. Um, so these metrics often disadvantage scholars from emerging fields and scholars from groups that have been historically excluded from the academy. So here are some common points to be aware of that show how someone with a strong research profile might not necessarily have the most publications published in the most cited journals in their field or have the most frequently cited publications. Um, so some of the reasons for this are um, scholars undertaking community-based research or community-engaged scholarship might take longer to publish, as there's oftentimes time and work required to build ethical and meaningful relationships with communities that, one, that a scholar might be working with. Um, furthermore, publications in academic journals might not be the be most effective, meaningful, or ethical medium of knowledge mobilization, depending on the, the research topic at hand. Scholars might be in emerging fields or in fields where networks are smaller because of historical barriers in accessing the academy for particular groups. Um, and then scholars might have gone on caregiving or health related leaves, that's pretty common. Um, the personal biases of scholars within um, an individual's academic networks might have resulted in things like gendered and racialized citation gaps. Um, and then finally, there's geographical biases against scholars from outside of Europe and North America or against scholars who publish in languages other than English. Um, all those things might also be at play. Um, so that's why maybe sticking a little bit too hard to these traditional metrics of, of research, evaluating research excellence don't always give us a good evaluation of, of research excellence um, and that rather we should be focusing on the merits of that work um, when, when thinking about academic adjudication processes like hiring, tenure, promotion, peer review processes, um, grant adjudication, like all these things. 
So these are points that you can keep in mind if you are ever in those decision-making spaces. Um, and there have been many calls to action in recent years surrounding research assessment practices. So one of the things I'll speak to today is the Leiden Manifesto. Um, the Leiden Manifesto for Research Metrics offers 10 guiding principles for moving beyond blanket understandings of research excellence. I've listed their 10 principles on the slide. I'm not going to read through them, but um, I'll give you the slides after. Um, so the Leiden Manifesto was published in Nature in 2015 by a group of public policy, scientometrics, and science policy researchers. It's its authors note the abuse of an obsession with impact factor statistics in the evaluation of scholarship. And in the early 2000s, um, just, just some context for why they, they put this out is that in the early 2000s, web-based citation tools made it seemingly easy to compare institutional research productivity and impact. St uh, tools such as Google Scholar, Insights, and SciVal um, popularized citation counting for individual researchers. And so then universities then began basing promotion decisions on like threshold H index values and on the number of articles published in like high impact journals. However, these metrics don't always translate well in assessing things like utility to society, utility to communities, to localities, to policy, to government, industry. Um, and these metrics can also be manipulated as well. Um, and you can read a little bit more about that um, on the Leiden Manifesto's website as well. It's a really great resource. So um, the next thing I want to speak about is uh, another barrier in um, in the in a bar another barrier to to equity and uh, diversity and inclusion in, in the research landscape, and that's citational politics. Um, so um, I should note that in this section, I'm going to be speaking about citational politics as it relates to research. But in August 2021, I co-presented a workshop with. Holly Gibbs, from, who's in the educational development team at Teaching and Learning. Um, and that presentation speaks more to citational politics and how it relates to like classroom spaces. And that might be of interest to folks at Cleary as well. And I can include a link to that workshop in the follow-up email after the session, if you'd like. But I think some of the, there's a lot of crossover between sort of what we talked about there and what I'm gonna be talking about here. So what is, what are citational politics? Um, citational politics, also sometimes called citational practices, refers to looking critically at the scaffolding upon which we and others in our disciplines build our ideas. So this includes doing things like being transparent about the historical and intellectual roots of your discipline. Um, that means building an awareness of the historical and political context from which your own discipline emerged. Um, this could in, uh, It includes engagement with debates and interventions made by non-dominant voices in your field, um, it also includes recognition of systemic inequities that inform the development of one's own discipline. Um, and this means engaging with the ways in which these inequities might have silenced, erased, or prevented certain groups from contributing to the field or from being recognized for their contributions. So, um, you know, outside of just um, like, we, this is why I guess like, even when it comes to like the merits of like science scholarship, like you can't always, um, you need to think about, okay, who has actually been given a chance to contribute to science scholarship um, and who might have been contributing and like doing that work, but because they as a group have not had access to the academy for whatever reason, be that like legal, informal or formal types of discrimination, um, their work wasn't, there might, they didn't have as much of a chance to be like recognized for the work that they were contributing to their field or the interventions that they would have been making in their field. And so um, that's sort of what we mean by citational politics is like maybe having that historical understanding and contextual understanding about where your own field of study came from and having a better awareness of like why certain voices might not be present um, in those conversations or as visible in, in these conversations um, because they, there have been different factors that have maybe excluded, erased, silenced, et cetera, those voices. So, um, how do all of these considerations apply in our work as scholars? Um, well, we have some degree of gatekeeping power to establish legitimacy and authority through the works that we choose to engage with or refrain from engaging with. Oftentimes, um, the way that we were taught a field was that our mentor shared with us the works of like originary or foundational thinkers um, who are frequently like able-bodied, cis-het, white men, people of privilege who form like a core, and then other voices are sort of included as interventions um, that might be like peripheral to those four defining voices. Um, so moving forward, we can instead think about how we can intervene in disciplinary conversations and take a critical eye to um, what might have been presented to us as like the core authoritative voices in a field. 
um, in our own individual practice, we can engage critically with the springboard upon which we build our ideas. Um, and so I hope that like sort of following this um, explanation, you can see how the approach that I'm ad that I'm describing here with regard to citational politics is different from this sort of tokenistic inclusion for the sake of like representational diversity. Um, so what I'm advocating for here is more about recognizing how power differentials and exclusion shapes who has a say in your scholarly community and taking conscious steps to address those power differentials through the, the types of work that you're engaging with. Um, so it is it is about making these active choices. Um, I also recognize like this, this particular call to action is it's it's focused on what we as individual scholars can do. I'm relaying just um, I'm going to show you the citation slide of like all the work that I've works that I've drawn um, from to build these slides, but I'm relaying what your peers have been saying to you sometimes like when I do deliver this presentation it's like oh well it's not really up to us as individuals like there are you know systemic changes that are needed I'm not denying that but I do think that you know whatever power it is that we do have in our individual practice like these are some things that can be done um, we we all have the power to sort of recognize and, and educate ourselves about what power differentials existed in our field and how we can maybe change the way that we um that we move forward in in whose work we engage with, how we engage with different works. Um, maybe there's knowledge gaps of our own that we might not have been aware of, of who has contributed to our field and who we need to make more, need to make more of an effort um, to include in the future. Um, so that brings me to how, what can we do? Um, so here are just some strategies with, that can guide you in amplifying the voices of scholars from equity deserving groups in your scholarly community. Um, so, one thing you can do is assess your own citational practices. So how did you come to decide who appears in you know, your, your footnotes, um, your resource lists, your syllabi? What relationship do the scholars in your notes and bibliography have to each other? Are there power differentials? Um, what shapes their interventions? Um, another thing you can do is to engage with scholarship and other works from the perspectives of marginalized scholars and communities that have faced a systemic oppression. Um, you can engage you know, deliberately with the work of early career scholars and precariously employed scholars, um, all of those things also help in um, in addressing sort of like power differentials in citational politics. Um, another thing you can do is to consider uh, including a wider range of sources that draw on diverse forms of knowledge dissemination, including things like conference presentations, public talks, newspaper articles, interviews, recorded talks, online blog posts, um, and artistic or multimedia projects. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, maybe we get into the habit of trying to, you know, where possible, legitimize the different and multiple ways that knowledge can be produced and, and disseminated um, and put forward. Um, so this is just a really helpful list. I'm going to leave this on this slide as well, like when, when I distribute it, because I have really learned a lot from all of these, these works um, about citational politics. And I think it's really important that you also engage with them if you'd like to learn more about um, about systemic inequities in citation in particular. Okay. So um, now that we've spent some time talking about the challenges and road roadblocks, um, we've spent a lot of time talking about that. I do want to sort of end this session with a quick overview of how scholars can embed EDI throughout their research process. So in this section, I'm going to be providing some strategies for inclusive research project design. And I'll go over Basically, what I'll, what I'll do is I'll go over some guiding questions that you can use to embed EDI considerations into your research process. So uh, what is inclusive research? Um, surprise, there's no single definition of inclusive research, but broadly speaking, it's an approach that can include things like participatory research, emancipatory research, user-led research, peer research, community research, activist scholarship, decolonizing, or indigenous research. Um, I'm going to be defining inclusive research, just broadly speaking, as an approach that actively engages with, responds to the needs of, and can be mobilized by communities that have been historically excluded from the academic research landscape. So inclusive research may also work towards things like unsettling the status quo of academic researchers, defining, handling, and controlling the interpretation of data, and, and making as well as communicating the conclusions of research itself. So just to more easily prompt ideas for our discussion slash Q&A session at the, at the end um, when I'm done talking, 
I want to first outline some strategies that prompt researchers from any discipline to think concretely about how EDI can be applied to their own research work. So broadly speaking, I want to show four sets of questions that um, I'm encouraging researchers to ask of their own projects at different stages. Um, and so these questions that I'm going to be presenting to you inform four stages of the research process. So I've sort of broken down the research process into um, the project design stage, the literature scan and data collection stage, analysis and methodology stage, and then the knowledge mobilization stage. So how, how might we be able to embed EDI considerations into those four different stages of the research process? Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to offer some questions that you can ask at each of those stages that might help you think through where you can reflect on and address power imbalances and systemic inequities in your own research project as you move through that process. So here, here are some questions that can inform the project design stage. And I use the term project design to refer to the stage at which you might be you know, early on planning a new research project um, or putting together um, you know, like a description of that work or something. So some questions you can ask at this stage are, um, is there a risk of excluding certain groups to the technical design of the project? Are there groups uh, of people that might experience this issue differently? Are differences investigated before they can be ruled out? How are differences in power between individuals and communities involved in the project navigated? Does the research involve communities in meaningful, respectful, reciprocal, and active ways? Why are researchers and communities working together? Do they have a shared purpose or do they want different things from the research? Is the research project built with reciprocity in the transmission of knowledge in mind? And are research relationships respectful? Do they include deep levels of collaboration and ethical engagement? Um, so the next stage of the research process that I'm gonna to speak to is the literature scan and data collection phase. Um, and I'm using this term to refer to the point at which you might be consulting works within your field that help you locate your own scholarly interventions and the data that you are using to build the conclusions to your research questions. So some questions that you can ask at this stage are, um, are groups being misunderstood or misrepresented as a result of how um, concepts and theories are currently framed in the field? Do existing concepts and theories in the field make assumptions about groups? Do concepts and theories need to be reformulated um, to take new evidence into account? Does the research use and reflect on insider knowledge? Does your literature scan address or include works by scholars from outside of Europe and North America, or if possible, non-English works? Um, and what inequities exist in your, within your field's traditional canon? And how does your literature uh, scan respond to those inequities? So again, going back to that citational politics question that I spoke about earlier. Um, so the third stage of the research process that I wanna to speak to is analysis and methodologies. And I'm just using this term to refer to the frameworks that, the, the, the frameworks that you use to reflect on your data and on the field as a whole that lead you to the conclusions to your own research questions. So some of these questions are similar to the questions on the previous slide, but um, you could, questions you could ask at this stage include, do researchers use and reflect on insider knowledge? How do you avoid making assumptions about groups? How do you account for diversity within test groups? How might your own positionality, biases, and privileges affect your interpretation of the data? So again, that um, a little bit of honesty about who you are as a researcher and recognizing like none of us are completely unbiased subjects. We all have lived experiences, um, identities, um, perspectives, that judgments that, that shape how we move throughout the world. So how is it, how can that not, you know, impact how you, you move through the research process and, and interpret data? So being, is there other ways you can be honest about that? Um, and then finally, do you, use, do you use and reflect on insider knowledge and on the contributions of marginalized scholars in your field? Um, and then the, the final phase of the research process that I want to speak to is um, knowledge, the knowledge mobilization phase. Um, so this is the stage at which you'd be communicating and mobilizing your research findings. So some questions that you can ask of your project at this stage include, um, how can this research promote equity? Have stakeholders in the research been consulted and do they represent a diversity of perspectives? Will the research be communicated in ways that, um, that like stakeholders in that research can access and respond to. Um, so beyond just uh, peer-reviewed academic journals, are there other places where you should be sharing this work? Um, especially given, you know, at Canadian universities, like scholars, faculty are, um, you know, publicly funded 
um, workers, right? So um, are the researchers transparent about everyone's role and, and contribution in the project? How and where will the research be talked about? Do the researchers accurately attribute credit to knowledge producers in that project? And are the research outcomes accessible? Um, so all of these, again, are really important questions that you can ask at, at the point at which you might be sharing research findings about a project. Um, and so with that, I'm going to actually leave it for um, open for questions. I know I've sort of thrown a lot at you. Um, before I do do that, though, I just want to share um, just opportunities at Laurier for further learning. So um, I, last summer, uh, our team created uh, an inclusive research course. This is actually like the header from the course. It's available through the self-registration tab on My Learning Space. Um, so if you go onto the My Learning Space landing page and then you click on um, self-registration tab, it's in like the top right corner. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll come to a roster where you can register for all sorts of free courses. But um, this course on inclusive research is just titled EDI-Inclusive Research. It's available to anyone with access to My Learning Space. So um, anyway, anyone essentially with a, with a Laurier login. Um, there's also, if you want to think a little bit more about um, EDI in like uh, appointment and promotions committees, there's the APC training course, again, available through the same self-registration roster. And then um, over the year, we've just been building different sort of topical conversation workshops. So back in October for Islamic Heritage Month, um, I co-presented a workshop for faculty and staff on understanding and dismantling Islamophobia in classroom and research settings with um, Nasser Ranmal from HR, Selda Sazen, who's Dr. Selda Sazen, who's the, the Muslim chaplain, chaplain at Laurier, and Humaira Javed, who's um, coordinator with CSETI. Um, so with that, I'll actually just turn it back to the question slide, but happy to answer any questions about what I said. Um, yeah, or if anyone has any questions that they'd like to, to ask me or any thoughts, considerations, if you know, I'm going to turn off the recording and maybe we can stop the slide share, the screen share.